Hello, my name is David Ledneiser, and I'm going to be giving a talk here on the 1937 Soviet transpolar flights to the United States, which, uh, in keeping with the theme of distance flights that we've been talking about here, is kind of unusual and it's not very well known in the United States. But on the other hand, it makes for very interesting history and it's got some nice humor to it. Um, so, here on the lead slide, we have the flags of the United States and the Soviet Union. And when I had one of my friends look at this presentation, the first thing he pointed out to me was I had the wrong U.S. flag on here. Because back at the time of these talks, there were 48 states, not 50. <laughs> so, yes, that's 1937 we're talking about. Anyways, um, <laughs> for those that are under the age of 30, you probably really don't know what the Soviet Union was. Um, it existed actually from November of 1917, the time, well, actually this is in the Julian calendar and they actually are in the Georgian calendar, but we'll speak Julian calendar here. Uh, that's the time when uh, the Bolsheviks overran uh, and took control of the uh, Russian government till December 25th, 1991, a day I well remember when uh, uh, Gorbachev uh, came on uh, the television and announced the dissolution of the Soviet Union, which is pretty remarkable in my lifetime. And as I note here, it broke up in the 15 independent nations that we know today. And you can see many of them there, Belarus, Ukraine, Moldova, uh, Lithuania, Lit Latvia, and Estonia got their independence back finally. And then of course we have Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, all down in the south, and Armenia, which finally got its independence. And then uh, of course up in the north, Russia. But at the time we're talking about here, this was all one huge country amazingly enough, uh, kind of a leftover from the conquest of the czars. And also, um, this map actually is a little bit accurate because it shows the Sakhalin Islands being owned by the uh, Soviet Union. And that was, of course, post-World War II. But it's good enough for what we're talking about here. So, to get to what we're intending to talk about, uh, this is the Breguet Range Equation, which is what engineers use to calculate the potential range of aircraft. And that will it'll be kind of important in what we're talking about here. Um, it basically breaks down into three component parts, the aerodynamics, uh, the propulsion, and the structures part. And the aero part is the lift to drag ratio of the aircraft. And you know that tells you how much lift you get for every unit of drag, or if you think about it inverse, um, what the price is you pay for getting the lift. Um, and then that's times the propulsive efficiency, the, well, actually the propeller efficiency in the case of a propeller airplane, divided by the brake specific fuel consumption, which is the fuel consumption per uh, hour per unit of power. And that's times the natural log of uh, the takeoff weight over the landing weight, which shows you the amount of disposable payload you'd have, which is assumed to be fuel. Uh, so from that, uh, Louis Brigade down there in the right hand corner. Uh, hypothesized and it's proven to be very accurate. You could calculate the range of an aircraft and we'll be making use of that as we go along here. Um, as I note here, of course, um, you got to have high lift to drag ratio for aerodynamic efficiency. You have to have higher propeller efficiency and really good low specific fuel consumption. And then lastly, you have to have a lot of fuel on board. So a lot of your takeoff weight disappears and you have very low um, structure weight or stru high structural efficiency. Anyways, uh, straight line distance record flights, um, we're gonna be talking about the standard held by the Federation Aeronautic International, which the Soviet Union actually only joined in 1936, kind of late in the going. Uh, many, most nations had joined much earlier than that. And the crew um, that makes the flight is only credited with the great circle distance. So if you might have a globe and you, and you go from point to point in a straight line and you lay it down flat on a map, it forms this circular arc, why we call it the great circle distance. Um, they have to carry a barograph, which measures uh, altitude to prove that they didn't stop anywhere in flight. It has to be sealed. It has to be weighed before the flight by a sanctioned observer. And nothing can leave the aircraft during the flight. <laughs> like, no one could bail out or anything like that. And it must surpass the previous record by the lesser of 1% or 100 kilometers, which will actually enter into the story in just a little bit. <laughs> and lastly, the crew may not die within 48 hours of the termination of the flight. So you can't crash at the end and have someone killed. Uh, so it's very important. In 48 hours, you have to survive, which 
we'll get to very late in the story. Actually, it's kind of a funny little side story. Anyways, the initial distance flights uh, back in the early days of aviation, uh, a lot of them involved, once again, they're the Breguet uh, 19 aircraft, which was uh, found to be very, have a lot of potential for flying great distances. And of course, this is Louis Breguet, who came up with the Breguet range equation to support exactly this work. And the early flights, of course, then he being French, were out of France, you can see that uh, the first flight I list there was to uh, Dakala in Morocco, uh, which is way down in the south. In fact, actually, if I remember right, Dakala actually it was Spanish uh, Morocco at the time. Um, and then the next one is to Basra in Iraq, uh, to Omsk in the Soviet Union, and then um, to Iran, and then finally another flight to Iran. And in each case, pushing the record up uh, to almost 3,000 nautical miles. And you can see that uh, one of the flights there, the second one was in the Potez uh, 28, that I show there on the right, but all the left were on the Brigade 19, the show over on the left. And of course, in the center there is the map showing the flights that these people made. And, you know, these are open cockpit airplanes that went very slow, and you can imagine they're long grinding flights. And, you know, you can see most of these were two-day flights. So the real kind of, uh, watershed moment, you might say, was Charles Lindbergh. Uh, his flight from Roosevelt Field in New York to Le Bourget in Paris in 1927, where he won the Orteg Prize for $25,000, and he won fame and fortune. He also did everything he needed to set an FAI record. And so he set the FAA uh, straight line, well, FAA open circuit distance record of 3136 nautical miles in his flight. And as I note there, he, 33 hours and a half, he was airborne, which is pretty remarkable. And of course, he's, if you read his book, he had a hell of a struggle staying awake. Um, it was really, really difficult for him. Um, the record, now, see, this record was in May of 1927. So in June, his record was broken. And what it was was Clarence Chamberlain and Charles Levine um, uh, had this Belanca aircraft, the Columbia, ready to go. In fact, Lindbergh had wanted to buy the Columbia, but because of uh, control that people wanted to have over the flight, he ended up not buying it, instead of going to Ryan for the NYP airplane. And Chamberlain and Levine uh, ended up uh, flying the airplane, but it was actually delayed because there were legal proceedings over who was gonna fly with Chamberlain. They could have actually beaten Lindbergh, but if they were squabbling so that they, they got delayed in their takeoff. But they ended up flying all the way to Berlin to set a record now of 30, roughly 3,400 miles. And then um, the Italians came back the next year and they flew uh, a Maki S-64, you can see down there below, kind of a crude looking airplane in my view, but they could fly it, they flew it from Italy to Brazil and uh, they had to land early. They could have even gone further, but they ran into bad weather. And then uh, that record stood for yet another year. And then uh, the Brigade 19, had an interrogation or flying question mark, uh, was flown from Le Bourget to uh, Chikar, China, which was outside of uh, Beijing, north of Beijing. And uh, when they, they, no one knew they were coming. So when they landed, the Chinese troops arrested them thinking they were Russians. And of course they weren't being, they were French. And uh, that was kind of an interesting record because if you look at that aircraft, it's not nearly as streamlined and low drag as the Ryan that I showed at the beginning, you know, of these the two flights back. But the uh, the airplane was basically a flying fuel tank. In fact, Super Bidum, which you see up there after the name, basically means flying fuel tank. So then um, the these fellows uh, decided they were going to try to break yet that another re record and push it up even higher with the day routine. And it was the, uh, the trade de union. Uh, they're going to fly nonstop to Tokyo, they thought. Um, but the problem was their engine failed um, in, over Siberia. And uh, two of the fellows bailed out and the third guy managed to ride the airplane and uh, I think something was wrong with his parachute, as you can remember. So he couldn't bail out and the airplane was destroyed, but they all survived. So they came back and there was a second one uh, available. So they tried to fly once again to Tokyo, just uh, five months later, but over the Ural Mountains, less far than they had been previously, the engine failed again in bad weather. And one of the fails, 
fellows bailed out, but the other two tried to crash land. And uh, you might notice the interesting little turnabout is the guy who bailed out was the guy who had ridden it in previously. But the other two guys tried to ride it in this time and they were killed in the, cr in the crash. You can see the airplane there. Um, so unfortunately, um, things did not work out well for them. Um, then also, um, so, uh, the, once again, a Brigade 19 took off just 10 minutes after the Daewoo team, um, also to fly to Tokyo, but they had a fuel leak and they had to put down a Dusseldorf. So both of those flights did not come to anything. And the Daewoo team 33, I mean, it's a gorgeous airplane. I, I really have admired it. So anyways, um, the next step was, uh, interesting enough, Russell Boardman um, and John Palando, um, uh, Russell Boardman being a fa fairly well-known American pilot, uh, flown the GB R1R2 hybrid, if I remember right, um, in, the, in the Bendix Trophy race. Well, anyways, in 1931, they flew that Blanca you see there, uh, the Cape Cod, from Floyd Bennett Field in New York all the way to Istanbul. Now, how did they do it? I mean, that airplane does not strike me as a long-range airplane. And I think the trick was they had a hell of a lot of fuel on board. But as you can see, they just barely broke the record and uh, got themselves into the, the record books that way. And this flight actually is pretty well known in Turkey, but otherwise it's, it's hard to find out anything about it. It's kind of disappeared into the, the mists of time. Well, okay, so then uh, the British got involved and they actually um, had uh, Royal Air Force paid ferry to develop the long range monoplane. Um, so the first attempt uh, was in 1929 but the, as I note here, they encountered headwinds. Um, they had to land at Karachi and didn't break the record. So then they attempted another flight. Instead of going east-west, they decided to go north-south and taking off again from Cranwell. Um, they were headed for, the, for South Africa. And in the middle of the night, they plowed into a mountain near Tunis um, in the French protectorate of Tunisia, which is now Tunisia itself. And uh, another airplane had to be built. So you could see there was a four-year gap. And then finally, the, the next one that was built flew all the way from the UK to Wallace Bay, South Africa, which is now Namibia, I can never say this, Namibia. Um, uh, and they set the record at 4,600 miles. And so the two crews I show down there below, uh, the crew on the, uh, on the right were the crew that broke the record, and the crew on the left were the ones who were killed in Tunisia. And the airplanes are pretty much the same. I believe, if I remember right, the first one didn't have uh, gear fairings, but other than that, they're identical. So anyways, um, 1933, so here we're talking 19, February 1933. In August, just several months later, uh, Blario, uh, Joseph de Brooks, Le Brooks, flew from Floyd Bennett again, all the way to uh, Syria, uh, which was then at that point a French mandate. And, uh, uh, they broke the record at 49.16. And once again, it's kind of surprising if you look at it, you know, the wheels hanging out in the breeze and everything. It kind of doesn't strike me as a low drag uh, configuration, but uh, had a lot of fuel on board. We'll be getting to those kind of details in a moment. So there was another attempt um, by the French, the Bernard 81. They were going to fly from Iran in French Algeria all the way to Vietnam, uh, Saigon in Vietnam. Um, but after 24 hours, they realized that their fuel consumption was six tenths of a percent higher than planned. And they were going to fall about 200 kilometers short. You can imagine the heartbreak. So they ended up landing in Karachi and they traced it all back to the tachometer being uh, faulty. And likely um, what that was is they're probably uh, leaning out um, by, you know, you lean out the engine until the tack, uh, the RPMs drop and then you richen things just a little bit. Well, if the tachometer gave them the wrong reading, they leaned it out incorrectly, and hence the fuel consumption was too high. So that was a real shame, and they never got a chance to try for the record again. Uh, so anyways, going parking back to the Brigade Range formula, um, these are the three components. And I've, I've actually found data for all of these airplanes and have been able to calculate the different components. And as you can see, um, the very top line is the structural efficiency. And you can see probably the, or, or you could call it structural efficiency or the amount of fuel they had on board and they were able to carry. And as you can see, the Brigade uh, point de interrogation probably was the, uh, the best of all. And as I say, it was crammed with fuel. 
And then as you go along, the airplanes, both the ones we talked about and ones we'll be getting to, um, didn't rely on fuel capacity necessarily as much as propulsive efficiency and, and uh, engine and aerodynamic efficiency. And you can see those two lines steadily arising with time. So as I note, we had a decreasing fuel fraction and increasing aerodynamic and propulsive efficiency as time went on, which kind of goes to figure because as the science of structural analysis and aerodynamic design proceeded, we could achieve those higher efficiencies. So anyways, now let's switch over slightly. Um, look real quickly at the political climate in the Soviet Union. This is gonna be the focus of our story next. Uh, of course, the founder was uh, Vladimir Lenin, who, of course, that was actually a pseudonym of his, his real name, which I can't even pronounce, but you can see it there. After he died in 1924, and actually he died one of those deaths where he had a stroke, they thought he was gonna die, he came back, he then he, he faded away again. Uh, and in that time, there was a power struggle between Joseph Stalin and others, including Leon Trotsky. And of course, you can see Stalin's real name there too. Uh, he was Georgian by birth. You can see it in his name there. Um, Stalin emerged as the new leader. And of course, Trotsky was actually exiled and later murdered in Mexico City. And just as a real quick side note, his great-granddaughter is now the head of the Mental Health Department of National Institute of Health in Washington, D.C., I discovered, which fascinates me to no end. Uh, her name is uh, Nora Vogel, Vogelman, if I remember right. Anyways, um, getting back to the story here, Stalin uh, was one of these control freaks, and he asserted detailed control over everything, including aeronautics, which basically he knew nothing about, but he decided he did. Um, so they had, of course, the secret police, which was kind of traditional in Russia. Uh, originally, it was a Cheka, now it was the OGPU, later it became the NKVD, then the KGB, and now, of course, you have the FSB. Anyways, they were the arm that uh, the mechanism by which Stalin repressed internal dissent and kind of kept control over everything. And at that point, the Soviet Union was internationally isolated. Uh, they were not recognized by the United States until 1933 because of that. And they were kind of this uh, blob, amorphous blob on the map that was kind of not recognized, not understood. Uh, the political climate and aeronautics in the Soviet Union uh, here we have Nikolai Polokoparov, who designed the I-6 uh, fighter aircraft. Um, and so what happened? Well, he didn't meet the deadlines on the program. So the OGPU arrested him and threw him in jail, 450 other aircraft designers and engineers. <clears throat> that was the price of not meeting schedules. And he was sentenced to death for the crime of industrial sabotage. But luckily, people realized this was all nonsense, and he was, his sentence was commuted to 10 years of forced labor. And that involved basically of he was held and worked from a prison design bureau. And so the next picture you see down there is of the I-5, which was actually designed in the prison. And that symbol on the tail is actually the logo of the prison. <laughs> I mean, we have full record of it, you know, in the photos. And then in 1931, he was granted amnesty, and he went on to design uh, other fighters. Of course, you see the I-16 there, which is at the Flying Heritage Collection uh, at Payne Field. And then he established his own design bureau in 1938, which you might say is real big rehabilitation for him. But um, he was out of the country, and there was basically an internal coup d'etat at the design bureau, and it got taken over by two guys named Nikoyan and Gavarovich, and it became MIG, which is the design bureau we all know. Uh, but the fellow that I want to focus more on is Andrei Tupolev. Um, he was a very early aeronautical engineer in the Soviet Union, and he was a student of Tchaikovsky, who was a very eminent uh, aerodynamic researcher. And uh, Tupolev himself was the first leader of SAGI, which is kind of the Soviet equivalent of NACA, which became NASA. And at the same time, uh, with the David Taylor Model Basin combined. David Taylor Model Basin is the U.S. Navy Research Center for Hydrodynamics. So basically, SAGI handled both aerodynamics and hydrodynamics. And you can see the uh, logo for SAGI below that picture of Joukowsky there. Anyways, Tupolev, working at SAGI, designed the first all-metal aircraft in the Soviet Union. Um, and he did it for a very good reason. As he pointed out, uh, metal 
is this uh, material that we call, um, let's see if I get this right, it's isotropic, right? Because it's the same in all directions. And if you have material, if you have a uh, metal that's been uh, machined, or I'm sorry, poured, rolled, et cetera, to a very tight spec, you know its properties. It's not like wood, which is, well, you think you know the properties, but it's kind of uncertain. Same with composites. And Tupolev was a very prolific designer, as we'll see. Um, his design bureau grew out of Sagi, and he was actually active until 1972 when he died. And he worked on the TU-144 SST even. So his, he had quite a life. And, uh, it, one of the very first jet airliners was credited to him, the Tupolev 104. As I say, the uh, Tupolev 144 SST, which was actually flew before Concorde even, and many bombers, some fighters, um, all kinds of aircraft. So anyways, um, the Soviets had a desire to show their prominence in aeronautics, and they wanted to fly from the Soviet Union to the US. And in 1929, uh, they staged a flight using the Antonov 4 there, which was a Tupolev design. Uh, it's ANT4, not Antonov, I'm sorry, um, a Tupolev design, uh, which was designed really as a bomber. And, but this one was modified. Uh, as I say, it was a TB1 bomber. And they flew it in stages from Moscow to New York, going the wrong way, so to say. They went to the east instead of to the west in, in steps. And you can see they had quite a crew on board. Um, they flew for, well, it was 137 hours of airborne time. But among the places they stopped, they went up the Aleutians, and then the picture there shows them actually at Sandpoint Naval Air Station on Lake Washington. And looking really carefully at the picture, and that one actually, it's hard to see, but I, I did some work on the image to try to get more out of it. And that red star shows, that's a map of uh, Sandpoint at the time, which of course is now Magnuson Park. And that red star shows right where that photo was taken. And while they were at Sandpoint, um, they had flown on wheels, as shown in the upper photo. And at Sandpoint, the wheels were removed in one of the hangars. And actually, I have a photo of it in the hangar at Sandpoint. And the floats that you see in that image were installed on the aircraft for the rest of the flight. Oops, I'm sorry, I got it backwards. The floats were taken off and the wheels were put on. There we go. So anyways, uh, at this point, uh, Tupolev uh, wanted to design a long-range bomber that could also set records. And he started in December of 1931 to design the airplane. And, and among the people on his design team was a guy named Pavlov Sukhoi. Of course, you recognize that name. It's now the design with the preeminent design bureau for fighter aircraft in, in Russia. And also, of course, they do the Sukhoi Superjet, so they're involved with commercial aircraft too. Anyways, Tupolev's goal was to fly 13,000 kilometers, which is quite a distance. And he, of course, an all metal design, very high aspect ratio wind. So, in other words, 13 times more span than cord, uh, is the way to look at that. He, of course, knew he needed retractable landing gear, and the photos show that there as a way of uh, reducing drag. Though, as you can see, their wheels weren't fully retracted. It's just that they weren't hanging out in the breeze as badly. And it was being powered by a single 750 horsepower, the coolant, uh, liquid cooled, normally aspirated V12, which had, interesting enough, articulated connecting rods. Now, most of V engines are set up so the cylinders on left and right sides of the bank aren't lined up. And that allows them to, to connect to the crankshaft down below in alternating fashion. Well, with an articulated connecting rod, the cylinders are lined up so you can have a shorter engine. And as you can see there, it's like a master rod bearing on a radial engine uh, with the additional articulation. It's kind of an interesting uh, concept that really wasn't repeated much thereafter. Uh, the airplane also had a ground adjustable propeller, much like uh, Lindbergh's airplane, and it had a crew of three, two pilots and a navigator in enclosed cockpits. And that picture down there at the bottom shows uh, the aircraft as it was first rolled out. In fact, the uh, image at the top shows a drawing of it as it first was rolled out. So they first flew it, uh, Mikhail Gromov, who was one of the, the test pilots in the Soviet Union, first flew it in June of 1933. And they installed an upgraded engine because the engine really didn't have enough power, but the results really weren't that great. So a second aircraft was built with a 900 horsepower engine and a three-bladed prop instead of two-bladed, and it was flown that fall. And they had a retractable, uncoupled radiator, as I'm pointing out there. So you could drop it out in the breeze when you needed it, and retract it when you wanted to lower drag. 
um, testing revealed that they were still short on range. So a drag reduction program was, was undertaken. And they had corrugated skins, as you could see there. And the corrugations actually went again, uh, at right angles to the flow on the wing, though on the tail surfaces, they were with the flow. And Pavloi Sukhoi uh, was responsible for the program, uh, getting the drag down. And so what he did was he filled in the corrugations with balsa wood and covered it all with fabric. And they also put a new cowling on with a fixed uh, radiator and shutters, as you can see down there on the bottom. So um, the aircraft now is theor theoret theoretically capable of 13,000 kilometers. And I calculate, see, actually it was reported, I calculate along with it, about a 36% reduction in drag, which is pretty phenomenal. I mean, it's, it's a lot of drag they, they pulled out of the airframe. So this is the internal layout of the aircraft. It's kind of a neat airplane. They uh, had an exhaust muff for heating the cockpit. Uh, as you can see, they had a pilot, um, a berth behind them for someone to sleep uh, when they're off duty, a navigator and a co-pilot. And the navigator was supposed to sit um, in that seat right behind the, you know, behind the berth and then the co-pilot. Well, in reality, quite often the co-pilot actually would crawl up onto the berth, and actually sat on the berth during landing and takeoffs even. Um, they had a full IFR panel, you can see in the lower left there, gyro compass. Um, they had a drift sight, as I indicate in the belly, so that you could actually take sights and, and figure out what the crosswind was you were fighting. Um, they had an HF radio, so they could try to communicate back with base, though they had issues still with, with propagation of the signal. And then you can see the co-pilot had a uh, subset of the panel in the back, though he really didn't fly from back there much. Um, and then by, at the bottom of the show there, they had a sun compass, because navigating up near the poles, if you think about it, the compass is really not any, any value because the compass now really is deflected and can do some odd things. So that you have to navigate with the sun. And they also had radio direction finders so they could try to uh, uh, get uh, DF bearings off of uh, known radio stations. Um, so first of all, they had the proof capability of the aircraft. And so the Gromov uh, with two other fellows uh, first did a closed circuit flight of 12,411 kilometers um, in the closed circuit to a degree, it, it really, they flew between different cities back and forth and kind of did, you know, whatever legs they could do to get distance to prove that it would actually work. Um, they had to take off from a special concrete runway, which was kind of novel in the Soviet Union, um, outside of Moscow. And it took three tries because they had problems with the engines, or the engine, I'm sorry. And then um, they weren't a member of the FAI yet, the Soviet Union wasn't. So it wasn't a record because it wasn't, you know, recognized by the FAI. Um, but it helped get Stalin's approval to go ahead and try to break a real FAI record and for the Soviet Union to join the FAI, which they did. Uh, but first, a uh, little bit about Gromov. Gromov um, was a very pioneering uh, pilot in the Soviet Union. Um, he made, <laughs> he bailed out of a, Polikoparov airplane and uh, made the first Soviet parachute jump, uh, which is pretty novel if you think about it. And he was a test pilot at Sagi for 11 years. He carried out uh, first flights or tests on a lot of aircraft of all manufacturers. He was also the first director of their Flight Research Institute uh, at Joukowsky Air Base, and, uh, which is still in operation, LLI. Yeah. L -I -I. And he served in both World War I and World War II. He didn't die until 1985. And of course, the Flight Research Institute was named after him in 91. So as Jimmy Doolittle once said, uh, it, it's not common that a, a, a test pilot dies of old age, but Jimmy Doolittle and Gromov were two that did. Uh, so anyways, this is their first flight. They were gonna use a transpolar flight from the Soviet Union to the United States. And because of that, only Canada and the U.S. needed to provide overflight uh, rights, which simplified life, especially with the Soviet Union kind of being on the outs for the rest of the world. Uh, Gromov was recovering from some surgery, so Stalin appointed this other guy uh, who was really quite a self-promoter um, as pilot, uh, Levinevsky. And uh, he was famous because there had been uh, some emergencies in the Arctic where he had gone and made uh, kind of heroic flights to rescue people off the ice. And his co-pilot uh, was the guy who was, who was a blind fight, a flying uh, 
uh, expert over there on the right. And then finally, uh, Victor uh, Levichenko, who is his navigator, was also very highly regarded. And they were a takeoff in, in August 1935. Um, <laughs> they got out 2,000 kilometers and they spotted oil coming out of the engine. There, there was quite a controversy because some people actually claimed that it was just natural oil getting blown overboard like it should have. But um, they decided, since they're going to be over the Arctic, that they should probably turn back and not attempt the record. So the airplane came back. And of course, Stalin wasn't happy. So there was this meeting with Stalin, and Levinevsky said, um, ah, the airplane's awful, I'm not going to fly it. And uh, he wanted a multi-engine airplane. So uh, this fellow, uh, Georgi uh, Batikov, uh, proposed to Stalin that this friend of his, uh, Valery Chekhov, be given an attempt, a try. And that's actually, uh, the first upper photo is a recreation of Levinsky. Levinsky talking to Stalin. Uh, the next photo down is Chakalov. And Chakalov was actually famous at this point for flying under the Trinity Bridge in Leningrad to impress his girlfriend. And you can actually see that photo at the bottom is a recreation from a movie in 1941 showing him doing it. In fact, you can actually find the movie online and actually watch it. Um, you know, it's a Hollywood style movie out of the Soviet Union, of course, but you can see how low the bridge was and he did it. So anyways, when Chakalov was asked uh, by Stalin, Stalin asked him, is it sufficiently reliable to fly in one engine? Chakalov replied, of course, it's sufficiently, you know, one engine carries 100% risk and four engines carries 400% risk. <laughs> so they got the job. So first of all, they were gonna make an internal flight just as a checkout to prove what it can do. And they flew from the Soviet Union as far east as they possibly could um, and landed on Ud Island right out on the far coast of the Soviet Siberia. And they didn't reach Karabovsk, Kar, Kabarovsk. Yeah, there we go. Due to bad weather, uh, they encountered fog and stuff. So they landed on the beach and you can see in that middle picture, there is, you know, after they had landed. And there was a wood runway built and they flew out uh, when the weather cleared. And once again, the record wasn't recognized because they weren't a member of the FAI yet, but um, they did break their, well, they, they went further than the record, let's put it that way. And Wood Island uh, was renamed by Stalin to Chekhalov Island because of the success of the flight. So anyways, um, so here we have Levnevsky, and, you know, as I said, he's a self-promoter. So he managed to somehow get uh, permission, and uh, he ended up picking up a Volte V1 on floats there, you see it, in Santa Monica. And uh, over the next six weeks, they ferried it on a very high profile flight back to Moscow. And you can see the path there that they took. They flew uh, north and then west across Siberia. And they stopped, of course, stopped in Seattle and floats were added to the airplane. And it was either at Renton Municipal or Sandpoint, I'm not certain which. At that point, Renton Municipal, of course, had a uh, seaplane ramp like they do today. And the other little thing of note was the Antonov. Uh, it hadn't broken the world record yet, but it had notoriety, so it was displayed at the Paris Air Salon. The Paris Air Salon became the Paris Air Show later years, but there it is in display in Paris. So anyways, this is the next record attempt. So now Chakalov has been given the crew he wants, and the airplane's all set up, and you can see it there coming down the special concrete runway, and they flew all the way to Pearson Field in Vancouver, Washington, down there on Columbia. Um, as you can see, it was a two-day flight uh, in June 1937. Um, of course, the airplane was named for Stalin's route, and their target was San Francisco, um, but they burned fuel faster than they thought they would. And if you look at that mileage, they didn't quite break the record, unfortunately. I mean, it was, it was a flight that got a lot of press. It's very famous. You, you can see it at Pearson Field. Pearson Field is a memorial to it and everything, but they didn't break the record. Um, and that lower picture is actually Chakalov handing over the barograph to the FAI uh, official, who is a U.S. Army officer, uh, to prove that they didn't land anywhere on, on the flight. So these are some of the challenges they face. Um, <laughs> Stalin required them to carry parachutes, despite the fact they argued, we bail out over the Arctic, we're dead. But they still had to carry parachutes, but they did carry full Arctic survival gear, but the cost was fuel. Um, they encountered very bad weather. They were in and out of cloud quite a bit. Um, they couldn't use the solar compass because they couldn't see the sun. 
Um, the magnetic compass, as they noted, was useless. And they did just had to plow on and do their best. Um, only the propeller was protected from icing. They had an alcohol slinger system on it, but they ran out of alcohol. And in the middle picture there, it just shows you an example of propeller icing. And they ended up with prop ice, and they had air, which produces a lot of vibrations, which usually sling, it's part of it sheds and part of it doesn't. And then they also, they ended up with really severe airframe icing, which you see in the bottom photo there. And they were forced to fly higher than planned. Um, <laughs> the radio got disconnected, and no one didn't know, no one noticed it for a while. Luckily, they got reconnected, but they didn't receive weather reports over Canada or the, U, or the US because of that. Um, they only have 3,600 liters of oxygen, so it was only 10 hours about, and they had to fly up to 20,000 feet to avoid icing, and they ended up exhausting their supply. And you can see on the bottom their uh, profile of their flight, and yeah, they were up at quite, quite high altitude and suffered from hypoxia. Uh, <laughs> A vent pipe froze in the engine and caused a big glog of fuel of cooling water to be expelled. And somehow they had to keep the engine cool, so they took all their drinking water and dumped it in. And then, not having anything else, they put urine in it <laughs> because it's a fluid. It handles you know heat rejection, and that's how they kept the engine going. Uh, they didn't have an autopilot; it had to be manually flown. And if you can look, if you think about it. They were flying this whole flight at roughly max L over D, which is about 1.2 stall speed. So that's the speed you fly an approach at. They basically flew an approach nonstop for this entire time of this flight. Uh, the cabin proved to be pretty poorly heated. In fact, you can see the suits they were wearing to stay warm, but uh, it still got really cold in the cabin. And they actually had their extra oil supply for the engine to congeal because uh, they were pumping in more oil as the flight went on. So um, with that aside and all that drama, this is the other thing. So this flight I just was talking about, if you look at the dates, was June 1937. This was happening just a month earlier. This is when Amelia Earhart and Fred Noonan were flying around the world. And in 29 legs, they, they got most of the way around the world and vanished on July 2nd. So right, they kind of bracketed the time of the Soviet flight. So there was a little bit of a, uh, competition in the news. But then, of course, when Emilia Earhart disappeared, um, that stayed in the news for quite a while, <laughs> to this day in some ways. So anyways, um, in July 1937, so we now, you know, just months later, uh, Mikhail Gromov was given his chance. He had recovered from surgery and stuff. And he put together his crew, and they took off in another Antonov 25 and flew all the way from the same air base outside Moscow to uh, San Jacinto, which is basically March Field down near Riverside in California, and broke the record this time. And they were a member of the FAI, the Soviet Union was, so it was a real record. They were allowed to not take parachutes in Arctic survival gear, so they got more fuel and oxygen, which really helped. And they would have gone even further, but they didn't have overflight rights from Mexico. So they had to land in California, but they encountered fog over Southern California and actually had to circle for four hours waiting for the fog to clear. And then, of course, the best of all, after landing, a California Ag Inspection Officer came on board and confiscated all their fruit. <laughs> if you've ever been on a flight back from Hawaii uh, to the mainland, you've been through this. I, I had tomatoes taken out of Costco salads I had because... Ag inspection didn't like it. By the way, the ag inspection in Hawaii is paid for by California. So it's really California ag inspection. Oh, and then if you ever drive to California, every highway, including I-5, when you get to the California border, you have to stop at ag inspection. And of course, they ask you, do you have any contraband? And you say, no, and then you go. <laughs> so anyways, so Levinevsky uh, had now been one up because someone else had broken the record. And they'd done it in a single engine airplane, no less. So he managed to get permission to fly this four engine bomber. And his goal was just to fly from Moscow to Fairbanks, not even a record. And <laughs> so here we go with the multi engine airplane. And they were, had radios, a radio on board. And their last transmission was they're about 200 kilometers beyond the North Pole. And the number four engine had failed. And they were never seen again. Ever. Nothing has ever been found. No one knows what happened to them. And as you can see, they're a crew of six. 
So the Soviets continued on, um, just to continue the story a little bit, um, wanted to break, continue to be in the, in the news, showing the aeronautic prowess. So the prototype uh, tuple of uh, DB-2 bomber was they were going to uh, fly a, a woman's distance record and once again fly east uh, across Siberia with a crew of three in 1938. And in adverse conditions, they missed their field where they're going to land. Um, finally, um, one of the crew bailed out and the other two crash landed it in, in the forest near the Sea of Okhotsk. And the poor gal that bailed out wandered for 10 days in the forest before she actually got rescued. Um, so what they did set a woman's distance record. So this is uh, uh, 1938. Um, but then for the overall absolute record that Gromov had set, the British then um, had these aircraft, the Victor, uh, Vickers Wellesleys, and they flew three of them in formation. And this is the RAF Long Range Development Unit, which was purposely set up to do this. In formation, they flew from Ismailia and Egypt in the, in the canal zone. And one of them was a little bit short on fuel, so he ended up landing in uh, Timur, which is, of course, now Indonesia. And because of that, he actually, that crew set the record, which they held for just several hours, because then the other two aircraft made it all the way to Australia. Um, they landed in Darwin, um, setting the record. And you can see all three crews there in that photo. So these aircraft were actually um, bombers that the British uh, had, had developed. Um, these were modified for distance flying, but they're actually, the bomber versions were actually used in East Africa during World War II, uh, fighting the Italians in Somaliland and Eritrea. And then the Soviets made one last attempt. They wanted to fly in 1939 to the New York World's Fair to get the press. And once again, a DB-3 bomber, which is an Aleutian design. And they departed Moscow. Uh, the crew encountered a storm over Labrador. Uh, they tried to climb over the storm, the cl storm clouds, but they went out, of, ran out of oxygen. They went hypoxic, and they put it down in New Brunswick, and that's actually a photo of the crash in New Brunswick. And uh, they didn't set a record, but they were airborne for about 23 hours. And the Soviets continued to be interested in trying to break a record, and they realized what they needed to do is have a pressurized cabin so they could fly at altitude. So this here um, is uh, Vladimir Chevesky, I think so. Um, he had been a Tupolev employee, and he spun off now and developed this BOK-1 aircraft you see in the upper right there. And it was being powered by a turbocharged engine, which you'd need for altitude. Um, it was further developed. They actually were going to put a diesel in it, turbocharged diesel, you see there in the middle. And they've calculated to have a range of 15,000 kilometers. So their goal is to fly around the world nonstop, uh, fairly northern latitude. And of course, the usual thing, they got behind schedule and he was arrested. <laughs> uh, and of course, World War II began uh, shortly thereafter and ended the whole thing. But once again, yeah, the old Soviet pension for arresting people that fell behind schedule on programs sneered them. Um, the aftermath of it all, um, Stalin had started the Great Terror in 1934, um, used that to basically go after the intellectuals and the educated in the Soviet Union. And it grew in scope. Um, after the show trial of Gregory Zinoviev and Lev uh, Kamenev. And Tupolev himself was then arrested in 1937. And he was, the bogus charge was that he sold a design to the Germans, you know, right? And many of his colleagues include uh, Vladimir Petlikov, who actually had worked for him, uh, Mayasevich, and, and Sergei Korolev were arrested. And that's actually Korolev's prison photo in the lower right there. Um, Sagi turned, uh, um, was turned into an NKVD, the Internal Security Police Design Bureau, with Tupolev in charge. And the Tupolev II and the PE-2 were both designed there. And they were very important aircraft for World War II. And you can see them in the upper right there, the two aircraft. Um, the upper photo is one I shot in China at a museum. It's one of the few PE-2s left. And uh, many of the engineers were finally released in 1941 after they proved uh, successful flights in both aircraft. Uh, Korolev actually wasn't freed from captivity until 44, and he is the brains behind the Soviet space program, and he actually died an early death because of injuries sustained in the gulag that he never really recovered from. In fact, the story was he couldn't even properly close his mouth because his jaw had been broken and improperly set, and so here's 
the country really owed him a debt of gratitude. And of course, he'd been treated like crap, but he still served his country. Um, so World War II interceded, and of course, there was a lot of aeronautical development during the war. So after the war, uh, a B-29 Super Fortress was used to set a record of flying from Guam to Washington, D.C. And then the P-2 Neptune, which had been designed right at the end of the war, uh, one was used to fly from Perth, Australia to Columbus, Ohio. And there you see it in the middle of the truculent turtle. And they actually had a kangaroo on board they had smuggled on. Um, they actually had a Jado takeoff also uh, because of the high fuel load they were carrying. They must not have dumped the bottles because, of course, you can't drop anything in flight, but um, they did have to use that. And then finally, a B-52 uh, was flown in 1962 all the way from Kadena uh, and Okinawa to uh, Spain, and that's the crew right there. And that record actually stood for many, many years. It was uh, an extremely long range uh, record. And that actually was just a line, standard line B-52H. Um, it was actually in service for many years thereafter, and I think it was finally wiped out in a crash at a Skoda Air Force Base, if I remember right. So there were projects to break the record. Jim Beatty, you know, the famous entrepreneur, uh, took a Schweitzer sailplane and was going to fly around the world. It's the uh, Love One. Uh, he had a heavily modified, uh, tried to make a record flight, uh, closed circuit flight, but it ended in an electrical failure. And then another fellow bought it, Jerry Mullins bought it, and finally did set a closed circuit uh, record, 16,000 kilometers. But the airplane probably really didn't have enough range to make it around the world. Um, the fellows at Quickie Aircraft, um, Tom Jewett and Gene Sheehan uh, got into the game and they were gonna do the free enterprise airplane. You see down there at the bottom, to fly around the world nonstop unrefueled. But of course, once again, they really didn't have the range to make it. And unfortunately, the aircraft crashed in 1982, killing Tom Jewett and kind of the, the end of things right there for the Quickie Company too. Uh, but that got Burt Rattan interested. So Burt decided he was gonna design an airplane to fly around the world nonstop unrefueled. And the plan was, he had a Continental 0240, actually it was Rolls-Royce built, if I remember right, uh, mounted in the front, and they had an I IOL 200, so liquid-cooled IO 200, or O200 with fuel injection um, in the back to power the airplane. It was all composite, mostly carbon fiber. Um, detailed design and construction were done by volunteers, me being one of them. I helped out with some of the aerodynamics work. And uh, first flew in 1984, and there were some uh, proving flights, including a record flight off the California coast, and of course some issues along the way, um, among them being the propellers. They had a couple of propeller failures, and at the last minute switched over to Hartzell propellers. Um, and then finally in December 1986, um, uh, Dick and Gina flew it around the world nonstop unrefueled. Um, over from December 14th through 23rd, so a nine-day flight. And I well remember it because um, I was trying to get a mortgage on a house in Indiana at the time, and uh, the mortgage officer couldn't understand what I did. She couldn't understand how someone could be an engineering consultant. And then I was on TV because of the flight, because there I was, and uh, she saw it. And the next day she called me up, she goes, now I know what you do for a job, and I got the mortgage. <laughs> so anyways, uh, the new record, which is both a closed circuit and an open uh, straight line distance record, because it was both, uh, was set um, 40,000 kilometers. And as I note there, 72% of the takeoff gross weight was fuel. It was an amazing fuel load. But that was one up yet again, where um, Richard Branson and Steve Fawcett came to Burt and wanted an airplane to break the records again. But Bert was too busy with Spaceship One, so he turned it all over to John Carco and Matt Giatana, Giatana and uh, Gianta, I'm sorry, sorry about that, Matt. And um, they designed the airplane around a single FJ-44 turbofan, and it was flown by John on uh, March, in March 2004. I wasn't involved, but uh, you know, I was well aware of it. Fawcett ended up flying the airplane um, circumnavigation of the world from Salinas, Kansas to Salinas, Kansas. Then later, um, he made a record flight from Kennedy Space Center all the way around the world and then on to the UK uh, to set a record. And then finally, he did one more from Salinas to Salinas. And that's Fawcett there with the airplane. And that airplane now is the National Air and Space Museum because it holds the records, which will probably be forever. 
So this is a, a history of the distance record. And you could see in the early days, there were progressive steps. And then there was a sudden jump when you go from the B-29 to the P, uh, P-2V uh, record. And then the B-52 is a progressive uh, it's progression. But then the next big jump was when you go to Voyager. And as I note here, there were really three eras, so to say. The wooden fabric airplanes, which kind of reached their peak at the Blario 110. And then the metal construction airplanes, which peak out with the B-52. And then finally, the composite construction airplanes, Voyager and Global Flyer, where they're able to get better uh, structural efficiency. And a real quick dissection of record flights. This is looking at some of the parameters of the Antonov, or, God, I keep saying Antonov, I meant Tupolev, versus the Rattan Voyager um, on their flights. And you can see the really big improvement was uh, going from L over D of 15 and a half to almost 22 with the Voyager. And these numbers, by the way, for the Voyager are numbers that I actually help work with. So I know they're accurate. And the numbers for the Tupolev I found in various documents. Um, you can see the propulsive term of the, Larry, or the Breguet equation uh, takes a big jump. And especially the weight fraction takes a huge jump because the structural efficiency of Voyager. A uh, really amazing thing, as I point out there, the average speed of the Tupolev was 1.2 times uh, stalled. So basically, you're flying the whole flight at the approach speed, which is not pleasant, let's put it that way. Uh, so today's state of the art. November 2005, the 777-200LR, the um, Boeing crew, including uh, Susanna Darcy, Heine Penniman, and John Cashman, um, Flew from Hong Kong to London, the, lo the long way, so to say, the long way, with 25 passengers on board, 21,000 kilometers, a standard production 777-200LR, um, maybe a light passenger load, but that's about it, and passengers willing to sit there for 22 hours, and uh, set an FAI distance record for a commercial aircraft. Uh, so it's pretty remarkable. So where to see them? The actual airplane that Chakalov flew to um, uh, Vancouver WA is in a museum now in uh, Chakalovsk, uh, which the town renamed after Chakalov, um, Southern Russia, if I remember right. There's a rec replica of it in the Central Air Force Museum at Monono, which is a spectacular museum that hope they'll get to someday. Um, interesting enough, the Brigade 19 Super Bidden is in the uh, French uh, Air and Space Museum in, uh, at Le Bourget. And that's my picture of it right there. Uh, I made a point of uh, getting to the museum primarily to see that airplane um, in 2009, if I remember right. The truculent turtle, the P2 Neptune that set the record from Australia to uh, Ohio, uh, it's actually in the Naval Air, Naval, National Naval Aviation Historical or Museum in Pensacola. And that's a photo over there at the bottom. Of course, the Spirit of St. Louis, uh, Lindbergh's airplane is the National Air and Space Museum on the mall. Um, and of course, there's replicas all over the place. Uh, there's one at Fantasy of Flight, there's one at the Yanks Air Museum, there's one at San Diego Aerospace Museum, there's several others, including a flying one I think is under construction right now. Uh, the Voyager is actually just down below the Ryan NYP in the same museum there on the mall. Uh, just in the same form as she was when she landed. In fact, you can see on the bottom there that they didn't even paint the bottom, some of the bottom of the airplane because they wanted to save weight paint. And that's how it said it's there. Um, there's a replica of Voyager in the uh, SeaTac, but that's only a replica. Um, and then finally, as I note, the Global Flyer is now in uh, the Stephen Uvar Hazy Center of NASA in Washington, DC. So lastly, uh, I want to kind of dedicate this presentation to the memory of John Carco. He's the fellow that was the project engineer and test pilot on the Virgin Global Flyer. And over 21 years, as I note there, John worked on about 20 aircraft programs at scale. Um, then he joined ICON, uh, where he was lead aero engineer and test pilot. And that lower picture of them is in the uh, cockpit of the ICON A5. And I worked with John, was a very good friend of him, both when he was at scale and at ICON. Uh, really got to know the fellow. And unfortunately, John was killed in the crash of an icon in May 2017 at Lake uh, Bessariba up uh, Northern California. Um, he flew up a blind uh, canyon and didn't have room to turn. He really tried to make the turn um, and 
didn't make it, let's put it that way. So anyways, that's my presentation on, technically on the 1937 Soviet flights, but in reality, distance flying in general. So thank you very much.